St. Francis Express Care Clinics inside the Shakopee and Savage High V stores are now open for patient care by appointment during convenient daytime, evening, and weekend hours. Appointments can be scheduled online or by phone. Visit stfrancis-shakopee.com forward slash express care for details. Good morning and welcome to the sixth episode of the Shakopee Chamber podcast. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at St. Francis Regional Medical Center right here in Shakopee. St. Francis Express Care Clinics inside the Shakopee and Savage Hy-Vee stores are now open for patient care by appointment during convenient daytime, evening, and weekend hours. Appointments can be scheduled online or by phone. Just visit stfrancis-shakopee.com forward slash express care for more details. So as you know, we started this podcast as a way to keep our members informed and engaged in a time when gathering is, well, not encouraged. And as much as we try to keep the topic from becoming all COVID all the time, it seems to be the topic that we cannot escape from and the topic where the rules keep changing, quite honestly. And today I'm super excited. Our guest is a friend of mine from the chamber world who's going to help us sort out some of these changing rules as it relates to retail. And Bruce is also one of the first people I met when I joined the chamber 10 years ago. And at that time he was president of the Twin West Chamber. Shortly thereafter, he left Twin West and joined the Minnesota Retailers Association of, uh, well, of Minnesota, I guess. So Bruce Newstead, welcome to the Shakopee Chamber podcast. As always, it is great to see you, my friend. How are you? I'm great, Angie Morning. Thanks so much for having me on. I love the idea of doing a podcast for your members during this time. So thanks for allowing me to be on the inaugural season. Well, the pleasure is all mine. And thank you for, I mean, you said it, it's the inaugural season and we're not quite the well-oiled machine. We will be someday. I mean, we're filming it in my office and, um, um, and you know, my um, pipeline of planning interviews is not as full as it should be. So I called you yesterday in full disclosure and you were like, yeah, and I know you moved your calendar around. So thank you for that. We appreciate it. Happy to anytime. All right, so let's dive right in. The mask mandate went into effect a little over a week ago. How are your members feeling? Because quite honestly, Bruce, I mean, I think we've seen way too many videos on social media where retailers are getting into violent altercations with non-mask wearers. Talk to me about how your members are feeling. Yeah, no, I think we've had a pretty good start to that. I mean, you would know from your community mm-hmm. as well, but I think we actually probably had a few more problems pre-mandate than we did yeah. you know, with, with retailers that had mandated on their own than we have had post. So we did a quick poll oh, about uh, half a week ago of retailers across the state. And yeah. by and large, 84, 85% of them said, you know what, people are coming in in masks. They understand it's the deal. Yeah, uh, They're complying. They may not love it, but they're, they're doing it and they're doing a good job at it. So yeah. I, we just haven't seen a ton of problems, which we are very grateful for. Because as you mentioned, it's, it's sort of like how we've, you know, it's sort of the politicization a little bit or the, the, the issue side of COVID. Everything comes out yeah. in one way, shape, manner, or form. And I think the masks is sort of that real easy issue for people to understand and react to. But it, by and large, it's gone pretty well, I think. Yeah, you know, we talked to a couple of our retailers uh, when it came out and even our restaurants too. And I said, how are you feeling about this? Because people are either, I mean, I feel like our whole world, we're living life in the end zone. So if we could just all come back between the 40s or heavens, even the 30s, <laughs> just get right, right kind of there. Right. But, but one of them said something that was really interesting. Um, he said, I'm almost relieved. It takes the onus off me of having to say, please put a mask on. This is our store rules. And, and people are really, um, they've got strong opinions about whether their rights are being infringed or not. So Bruce, what advice are you giving your members and retailers on how they're supposed to respond to customers who want to come into their store without a mask? Because right. God, no. I, if I never see another video like the Costco video, it'll be right. too soon. Right. No, yeah. I, and I think, you know, a lot of, well, let's face it, somebody who wants to make a problem is going to make a problem. Yeah. But for, for the balance of people, and, that, and that's very, very few people, but for the balance, I think we recommend two things. One, just be really clear with your signage. I mean, today, yeah. Yeah, as you walk into a store, you should probably see two signs. You should see a sign that talks about masks and the mandate there. Mm-hmm. And you should see a sign that says, you know, if you don't feel well today or know somebody who's been sick recently, today is not a great day to shop. <laughs> so those are kind of where it's like, be really clear with your signage, you know, and, and have fun with it, but be clear with yeah. it is number one. And the number two, you know, we'd say to retailers, just 
sort of deal with that non-compliant customer like you would with any other customer. You know, somebody walks in without shoes on, without a shirt on, or, you know, a lot of profanity. However you would deal with that customer yeah. is a great framework for how to deal with a non-compliant mass customer. And like in all situations, sometimes you can fix that situation. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you just have to get through it and, you know, handle it the same way and you'll be in pretty good shape from our perspective. Yeah, that's great advice. And you're, you're right, like overcomplicating the situation is, is not good, COVID or not. Right. But that brings up um, where there's been a lot of talk about liability issues and um, the fear that there's going to be a surge of third-party lawsuits against retailers or hospitality um, industry by patrons that point the finger at, at that particular business's handling of the virus. What sort of things are being done to protect the retailer and the hospital? I mean, anybody. I mean, somebody could walk into our office and say, it was right. filthy and now I'm sick. Right. They I mean, it's a fascinating, it. yeah, it's a fascinating issue. And, and in the end, it's really an economic issue too. Mm -hmm. I think just to take a step back on that, you know, we're, we're all sort of getting into the COVID mode now. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, it's sort of normalized for us. And now we're starting to think about some of the things we're seeing in other states. And, and Angie, I know you were active in this. Think of the Americans with Disabilities Act yeah. and some of the frivolous, what we would call kind of frivolous lawsuits that you mm -hmm. saw there. Yeah. You know, we're worried about seeing those in the healthcare environment and the retail environment, yeah. really in any business. So what we're trying to do is just work with our state legislature, the federal government to figure out what is sort of that, you know, we got relief in a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's financial relief. This is an area where we could really use some liability relief. Yeah. Uh, what does so that look like? Like the ADA issue. Just it's, it's not you want to protect employers from things that they did wrong or bad yeah. or guidance. It's really all about how do you protect someone who's done the very best that they can. They've followed the local rules. They followed the state rules. They followed the federal rules. Um, but, you know, inevitably somebody, an employee, a customer is going to get COVID. And we just feel like there should be some liability protection, liability relief in those cases. Yeah. You know, and it's, I, I feel like if that happens, it's going to be really hard to prove where that came from. I mean, oh, yeah. unless we all get chips implanted in our head and track ourselves right. for all of time, right. which there are those who think that that's what this is all about. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, right. but yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, that's a great I, point. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's no way to know. I mean, especially now, you know, you hear all of the health professionals saying that so 85% of us are going to get it. Most of us won't even be symptomatic. So how right. do you know if I walk into your store today and I feel great, but in right. a week, all of a sudden I'm positive that I got it there or I walked in with it. I mean, I right. just feel like that would be a really, I guess the lawyers would make a lot of money, but I feel like that would be a really hard thing to prove. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think we're just kind of, I think if you're a retailer on Main Street, Minnesota, you're, you're worried that that's the next shoe to drop, right? You've, yeah. you've had this, this, this deal where COVID probably took you out of pocket for a while. Mm -hmm. um, our research says that most retailers have lost 20 to 70% of their revenue in the first yeah. four months of the year. I mean, that's a, I mean, I know we're sort of all feel like we're getting used to this environment, but those are numbers that are hard to climb back from. Yeah. And future is a little uncertain relative to how things will look for the rest of the year. And so this is like the other shoe could be this liability piece, um, frivolous yeah. in nature. But again, so it's sort of some kind of timely targeted yeah. uh, liability really, and, 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 and really temporary. I mean, yeah. I don't think retailers or other businesses or healthcare institutions are asking for liability relief forever. It's like temporary for the COVID time. Yeah, which hopefully is temporary. Although, I mean, they say we're going to be living with this like we do the flu. We just, we're in the normalization process of it. So you bring up a good point that I was going to get to, Bruce, and that retailers are closing. I mean, I know here in Shakopee, in the last 30 days, I've lost two retail businesses. And I'm talking to others that you know, it's, it's touch and go. And then you read headlines like Ann Taylor, Lord and Taylor, everyone's filing bankruptcy or closing their doors. What is the outlook for the retail industry? How do they survive it? I think it's a great question. I think, I mean, I'm, just to, to think about it, like our, again, our survey work says that the average retailer invested five to $50,000 mm -hmm. in sort of COVID mitigation. So let's just say on, on, the, on the middle end, let's say you've put $30,000 into plexiglass barriers and mm -hmm. sanitation and extra hours and those types of things. On top of that, 
20 to 70 percent loss in revenue i mean we're gonna we're definitely gonna see some shakeout and as you sort of just alluded to it's it's not like we got open for curbside or back with customers in our store and things were magically fixed no you know, i think of you know like bruce newstead has gotten two haircuts right in the last arguably five months mm -hmm. um, you know but you don't i don't go back and replace those haircuts so you've mm -hmm. got revenue that you, a lot of retailers just can't mm -hmm. uh, bring back and it's going to be a real challenge for those that are are kind of holding on right now mm -hmm. i mean think about the cycle you're actually starting to think well, actually you're beyond thinking you're acting on your holiday plan now right yeah you're hoping <laughs> for a good no, holiday that <laughs> so many retailers hold on to as as the hope yeah. and you're investing in that inventory now so even though you see like you said a couple you know shakopee uh, retailers folding which is sad mm -hmm. we hate to yeah. see that heartbreaking the holidays are going to be the the real true telling moment is you're going to invest in the holidays and are, are the sales and the customers there and if they're not at a reasonable level really mm -hmm. You know, after that first of the year or even toward the latter part of December, so we're going to see some really tough shakeout if things don't turn around a little bit. Yeah. How does online play into all of this, Bruce? I mean, I know Amazon has programs for small businesses, whether they're taking advantage of that or not, but how does that play into all of this? Right. It, you know, I think, I think one of the things we learned, I, don't, I, I forget the stat now, but it was somewhere around 30 to 40 percent of, of retailers in Minnesota maybe had a website, but no way to really facilitate what brands are you carrying, mm -hmm. what products are in stock. I mean, forget about ordering. Ordering is really important, but just even short of that, you know, consumers need to know what you have and if you have it, because as we always say, you know what beats two-day delivery is being able to call a store <laughs> and drive down there in 15 minutes and pick it up. I mean, that beats yeah. delivery, two-day delivery All day every time. Yeah. So I think we have seen uh, retailers sort of realize uh, the importance of a robust online presence. Again, I don't even think you have to sell online, but I think mm -hmm. you have to have a customer be able to see what you have mm -hmm. and have an easy way to contact you. And it turns out an easy way to contact a retailer is actually a phone. <laughs> so, you know, we've seen a lot of retailers like reposition where their phone number is. It used to be on the bottom of the page and now they've repositioned it. So I, I think there's some simple technology upgrades that can be done. And, mm -hmm. and I do think most retailers are looking at sort of the uh, long term. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably an average consumer like you, Angie. I call myself a crossover consumer. Okay. Right? I like, um, I like my, my big brand experience. I mm -hmm. like the um, kind of repetition. And I also like my small stores. I like mm -hmm. that unique small store. So we're all, Minnesotans are largely crossover yeah. uh, consumers. We, we shop it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, this COVID has really challenged, I think, the big retailers to think like a small retailer mm -hmm. and a smaller retailer to think like a big retailer. And so we're kind of seeing technology kind of meet in the middle somewhere there. It's got to keep you and your team there at the MNRA very busy. Yeah, it's fun. Well, the policy stuff is fun. And then you get into some of the operations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you, we just sort of function as a hub for retailers and mm -hmm. best practices and good ideas. So uh, while it's certainly been a challenging time, professionally, it's been sort of a fulfilling time as well. Yeah, I, had a, I was having a conversation with a reporter from the Savage Pacer yesterday. And now more than ever, our members really do need us. Yeah. And so it's it's a great time to um, <clears throat> advocate and 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 help where we can. But yeah, challenging. We we've never seen this, right? Right, right. Well, and you know, kudos to you. I, we did a blog post up maybe a month and a half ago, and I, we really believe that kind of local chambers working with their cities mm -hmm. have saved or are saving Main Street. I mean, I I know there's great federal programs out there, and they're important. But when we look at sort of the snapshot of what are chambers doing and what are local cities doing. That's the stuff that's really, you know, making a difference for, for all of us and for uh, retailers across the board. So think of that in terms of like when we got curbside open, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your ability to work with the city to say, hey, you know what, we need more space for somebody to pull up outside of a, mm -hmm. a retail environment to pick up their goods and just some mm -hmm. of those things that you guys are doing. I know you've trained your whole life for this. You didn't know <laughs> this is what you were training for. But yeah. I know as a chamber exec, you've trained your whole life for this. And so thanks for doing that. Well, you're sweet. Thank you. And you know, because you're walking in it. And you know, the chamber, the association, we're all doing the same thing, right? It's all about our members. You bring up a point, Bruce, about, um, you know, the percentages and businesses being, first it was, okay, you can open for curbside or, okay, you can open at 25% and per your fire code occupancy. You know, like 
God, these retailers and restaurants have suffered so much. And to your point earlier, they're spending this money to make the accommodations and then they're only allowed to open at a fraction. And each day that they're open sends a really strong message to the consumer, but they're probably finishing the day in the red. So, you know, are these percentages um, helpful? Are they the kiss of death? And and, and I'm just going to throw it out there. I mean, the big hot question from the beginning is how in the world can the Walmarts and the Menards of of America be open at 100% just because they sell bananas. But, you know, I can't go buy a shirt and socks at a specialty clothing store or buy a gift at at a, you know, gift shop. How is that even possible? Right. Yeah. And I think percentages are sort of the double-edged sword, right? I Mm -hmm. think the administration was looking for something universal to understand how can we reduce capacity? Mm-hmm. Um, and part of that is, and this is not a criticism, but you know, um, the administ- the Wells administration doesn't work in retail. They don't no. work in stores. They don't work in salons. So you know, it's it's just it's it's a different thought process there. Mm-hmm. So I think in some ways, uh, occupancy percentages have been good because it's something we can all understand. The downside to it is, and and you know this better than anybody. Every retail environment, it doesn't matter restaurant or so, everyone is different. Yeah. You know, show are in different places. There's different amounts of product. It's so in some ways that's the that's the bad edge of the occupancy standard is it doesn't really recognize how a store is laid out, yeah. what its air filtration system is. So and I'm hoping, especially uh, you know certainly in the retail environment, hopefully restaurants, hoping we can see some movement. You know we've got the mask mandate in place. Mm-hmm. The idea behind the mask mandate is that that we can uh, sort of control the spread. I'm hoping in another 10 days or so we see some successful yeah. spread control and we can actually move those percentages a little bit because there are some retail environments that are really, really challenged uh, on yeah. the numbers. Yeah, for sure. Now, <clears throat> you talk about what, what we hope to see in 10 days, but if you look at, if you listen to the news, which I've been trying to avoid as much as possible, <laughs> it seems like lately, but clearly there's a surge, especially in the South in cases. And as you look at that map, it feels like there's always more red hot spots, red states. And logic might suggest that it's super hot where it's surging right now. So people are going back inside. Well, we're going to come to the opposite. It's going to be cold here and we're going to be going back inside. And and many of us fear, and the governor has sort of implied a <clears throat> veiled threat that we're going to face more shutdowns and the dialing of the turning of the dial will go backwards. What, what are your thoughts on that? And how are you preparing your members, God forbid, for that reality? Right. You know, I, I, I do, you know, you sort of, I'm, I'm like you. I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a public health professional. I just, I just look at the numbers like the mm-hmm. average Minnesotan. And I do wish we were seeing a little bit you know, continued downtrending mm-hmm. here in Minnesota. I think we, you know, we might be looking at our new norm from a numbers perspective, you know, for the next you know, six weeks, and then we'll see what, what winter brings. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think what I tell retailers is, um, you know, figure out how to survive at your occupancy standards that you're at right now. Uh, Make some suggestions, make some changes, but make some suggestions to us on what would be a better number. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think we're going to be, I think we're going to be sitting looking at percentage numbers, you know, probably through the end of the year. And it's our job to make sure that we can live with those numbers. So if 50% isn't the right number, you know, let's work hard to get there. So it, it's not great advice. It's kind of straightforward advice, but I, like you, am, am worried sort of about how the numbers look. Yeah. Um, but you know what, the funny thing about this deal is there's no way to really tell, like you said, is it weather? Is it, you know, what is it that is having the impact? And yeah. this is, it's a mysterious dis- mm-hmm virus from that perspective. But so my advice is generally like, you know what, figure out how to best make the model work today. Mm-hmm. Assume today is your baseline. Hopefully we can make some changes. Yeah. Hopefully we can get things better. Um, but you know, we today we've really got to be focused on what's what's the right model. And I know like for, for chambers and and others, I know you struggle with what type of events can you hold? Like I know <laughs> you had a golf tournament. I heard it was fantastic by the way. So fun. Um, you know, like, figure out what you can do in this environment in a safe way and kind of build off of that. Yeah. You know, and that is, it's like, we can't be afraid to try something, but we have to be willing to accept that there are new limits that we're not used to. So what do, what do your members, what do the retailers want the general public to know? I mean, what do they need from us other than our money? Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. No, I think, um, you know, we're still working on the message of, you know, retailers are really safe. But in a, you think of the average time a consumer spends in a retail store. I think sometimes it's easy to sort of lose 
the translation. Uh, a lot of times I think the governor talks about uh, spots where you're having long-term exposure with a lot mm -hmm. of people. And, you know, a lot of retail environments aren't that. A lot of retail environments by their very nature are, are going to be more safe because it's kind of a an in and out. Mm -hmm. You may spend 10 minutes there, but, um, you know, so I think just kind of running that filter for your local retailers and your community retailers to say, you know what, it's actually probably a really, really safe place for me to be. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to work on that consumer confidence part because um, to be honest, you know, I, I think probably 60 to 70 percent of our consumers are back to sort of a little bit of their normal shopping habits. Yeah. And so you'd say to yourself, well, that's 40 to 30 percent aren't. That's actually where, you know, where you actually probably make your money, mm -hmm. you know, low margin business, high volume of people. Um, so we really do need sort of everybody supporting their community retailers now more than ever. Wash your hands, put your mask on and get back to the store. I, I thank you for that, Bruce, because I'm going to go home and tell my husband that the store is the safest place, according to my friend Bruce Newstead, and I need to go shopping. Right on. <laughs> Plan, expect a call. Um, so, you know, pre-COVID, Bruce, you and I and all of our colleagues in the association and nonprofit world, all of our conversations seem to focus around workforce and the lack of um, not talent, but the lack of human beings here in, in Minnesota. Now that's still a topic, but it's changed. And there was talk, you know, before this, uh, this week started that retailers and restaurants were having a hard time getting their employees back because they were making more on UI with that extra 600. And now that's ended. But now we're faced with, okay, well, daycares are closing. Schools mm -hmm. are sort of coming back. And now these people who could come back and aren't making the extra 600 probably still can't. What is, what is on the horizon? What are you, <laughs> your members have to be panicking. Right. No, I, you framed it up nicely. I mean, we were, we were an industry that had some workforce availability issues to begin with mm -hmm. and then you layer COVID on top of it. And, and I'm not being critical of the $600 from no. the federal that came at a really important time. Mm -hmm. um, and now that has dropped off. So, you know, we sort of feel like there's a balance there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, $600 for a $14 employee making or working 30 hours a week, that might be a little bit of a disincentive to return to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we think there's, there's probably a balance in there. Like the U.S. Chamber has got a really great proposal. I know our friends at the National Retail Federation, others have great proposals. And I actually think, uh, you know, up at the federal level, Democrats and Republicans both have pretty good proposals, mm -hmm. but they have to figure out how to meet in the middle. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm right. not very optimistic about that, Bruce, right. given right. the daily goings on out there. Right. But there's, you know, there's, there's a balance there. Yeah. Somewhere. And it's probably, you know, somewhere between two and $400 with some, you know, income replacement threshold of 50. Mm -hmm. to it, there, there is something there. We just hope Congress moves on it quick because yeah. Um, you know, the reality is not all jobs have returned, you know, some have, but not all have. And so we certainly need to continue to support people. This is certainly an extraordinary time. Oh my um, gosh. Yes. There's, there's gotta be a balance there. And I think, you know, smart people, smarter people than me can figure that out. But I actually, I think you or I could sit down at a, a, a diner and figure it out as well. So hopeful that, um, that comes together somewhat soon. Yeah, you and me both. Because, you know, those people who are relying on it, whose jobs aren't back yet. And I think about even talking to some of our colleagues in the chamber world or the destination marketing where we weren't afforded the luxury of payroll protection. And so uh, staffs are being furloughed and they, as an employer, you could feel kind of okay about it because you knew they were still being taken care of. I mean, when you have people who work for you, you want to make sure that they can, they it's all about making sure they can feed their families and pay their bills, right? And then this hit. And and so that was a nice, you're right, that 600 came at a really good time, but they need to figure that out. So hopefully this week will be a accomplished one. Yes. So, but now the whole school thing, right? You know, daycare's closing and school's opening. So I don't know that, um, I don't know that there's going to be an easy fix or an easy solution or that that the employers aren't going to feel this pain right. pinch because we were feeling it pre-pandemic right so it's not going anywhere right. so yeah you need to see some amazing flexibility by employers you know you you might have your your students i mean you might have students at different grade levels with different models 
Mm-hmm. And that model might change. It's just um, we're going to really test the flexibility of, of today's employment relationships. Uh, and the great thing is like retailers generally have been some of the more flexible uh, employers. Yeah. But it's, it's, like you said, it's just, it's universal. It's a, it's a problem for everybody. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm a little worried about the workforce side of the school part of it. I yeah. think I know, I know we'll get through it, but I think it's, if there's anything that should keep you up a little bit at night is trying to figure out how that's going to work out. Oh, Bruce, it keeps me up at night. I have an 11 year old who's entering middle school. Okay. I mean, like that transition was going to be a nightmare to navigate anyhow. And now we're going to be doing it sort of from home, sort of not from home. So, oh, well, you know what? It is a moment in time. We will get through this. And there've been far harder things that we as a nation have survived. And so um, we'll, we'll get through it. Well, Mr. Newstead, we have taken up 30 minutes of your time already. I appreciate you being here more than you know. And um, I guess I'm just going to ask you, is there anything else you want to add that we've not talked about that's important to the MNRA or that you want people to know other than get out and do your holiday shopping local? Right. (laughs) That's that's great advice. It's a great spot to wrap things up, Angie. But thanks to you and the team there and everybody in the community and all your retailers that are holding on trying to figure out how to best serve customers today. Uh, and as you said, it's important just to get out and, and shop and support those in your community now, yeah. now more than ever. Like you said, we'll get through this. We'll figure it out. Um, there's, and, and like I say, with all things, anytime a problem comes up with my kid, maybe you call this problem avoidance, but time is something that generally f- helps figure things out, but it requires people like you and me and smart retailers to put our heads together and, and figure out what are the smart policy things that come along with this too. So thanks for your collaboration on that and the folks at the city, we appreciate it. But yeah, shop in your community. That makes all the difference today. Shop thanks. local, shop often. I'm going to go home and tell my husband, you said it, it's true. Yeah. All right. And I want to thank you, Mr. Newstead, for joining us. And I also want to thank our friends at St. Francis for making this podcast possible with their generous sponsorship. Thanks so much. Have a great day. And be well. St. Francis Express Care Clinics inside the Shakopee and Savage Hy-Vee stores are now open for patient care by appointment during convenient daytime, evening, and weekend hours. Appointments can be scheduled online or by phone. Visit stfrancis-shakopee.com forward slash Express Care for details.